Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Stan Grant. Coming up, after missed milestones, broken promises and harassment scandals, Scott Morrison's approval rating falls to its lowest point in a year. Ousted Australia Post Chief Executive Christine Holgate has her day in the Senate. I really do hope you are not saying to me that I was hung in Parliament, humiliated, not just hung, run over by a bus and reverse again. The perils of on-demand work, gig businesses contemplate new models of employment, guaranteeing basic rights and pay. Well, joining me on the panel, Chair of the Committee of Economic Development Australia and Non-Executive Director, Diane Smith-Gander. Diane, nice to see you. Yeah, great to see you, Stan. Industry Professor at the Jambana Institute of Education and Research at the University of Technology, Sydney, and Labor Party member, Noreen Young. It's always nice to see you, Noreen. Thanks, Stan. Nice to see you. And Managing Director of Communications and Public Relations firm, Agenda C, Parnell McGuinness. Hi, Parnell. Hi. And in Melbourne, lawyer, disability advocate and former Green staffer, Sam Drummond. Good to have you, Sam. Hi, Stan. And of course, you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum, and we're on Facebook. Well, less than two months ago, the Prime Minister was flying high. With very few cases of COVID in Australia, Scott Morrison enjoyed record high approval levels. But since then, missed vaccine targets, a string of sexual misconduct allegations in Canberra, have eroded his support. Now, the latest news poll puts the PM's approval at its lowest level in 12 months, dropping to 54%. That's from 65% in February. More than half of the respondents say the vaccine rollout is taking too long, with the federal government identified as chiefly responsible for the problems. However, the usual caveats apply here. Support for Anthony Albanese as an alternative has only seen a tiny increase and the majority of people still approve of the coalition's management of the pandemic. But the vaccine rollout has opened up a highly effective attack line for the opposition. As the public realise, it's increasingly unlikely that international travel will return in any meaningful way this year. The reality is that Australians are being held hostage to a botched vaccine rollout. I mean, people were hoping that the vaccines were a par for a ticket back to normal, but now we find out that travel mightn't be a, a thing till 2024. The problem is we were promised that we'd be doing better than we are. The problem is that we do need tourists to help fuel our economy. We do need international students. We do need our people to be able to go overseas. Parnell, I want to drill down into what these numbers are telling us and how much of a factor COVID has been, how much of a factor you know, the women's issues at the moment have been, and that plays into something else we're going to come to as well. But just your assessment of these numbers in and of themselves, someone who was riding high, who had seen off the worst of the pandemic, up against an opposition that wasn't gaining any traction, and now this, what do you read into it? Well, obviously, a lot of the things that are happening are actually cutting through. Um, but I think that it's really important to remember in all of this, when we look at these numbers, um, his pop Scott Morrison's popularity is slipping and it is slipping widely, but it is not necessarily slipping on matters which decide people's vote at an election. So that is, that is something that you've always got to bear in mind when you look at polls mm. like this, that they reflect how, how a Prime Minister is, is seen to be um, performing on something like the vaccine rollout, on women, for instance, um, but not necessarily on hip pocket issues, which are the issues which, at the end of the day, usually decide elections. Diane Smith-Gander, though, something like COVID, which has been front and centre, and, I dare say, has been an economic issue as well. Um, and, of course, we're now seeing JobKeeper and job, job seeker coming off and we're going to see what impact that is going to have down the line as well. Because of COVID, because of the problems with the vaccine, coupled with the other issues he's dealing with, is this more alarming? Is this something that could change votes? I think it is, Stan, because people's hip pocket nerve is going to be most determined by whether or not they have a job and what their prospects for a job actually look like. So when people start to look forward and say, will I be able to work? Will the job that I've had still be there in the future? And they start to get uncertain about that and that lack of certainty is all rolled up into whether or not I can have a COVID vaccine or not and whether my colleagues will have a COVID vaccine and how I can be comfortable to go back to the office 
and do all of the things that goes along with that, I think it really does become a hip pocket nerve issue. And Sam, there is, you know, to, to quote the famous line out of the castle, there is the vibe, isn't there? And the vibe right now is so bad. Yeah, the vibe, I would say, um, is that things appear to be getting back to normal within the community. But when we're starting to see the images come through from overseas of mass vaccinations, then that vibe starts to feel like very much like we are becoming a bit of a laggard on the international stage. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, when Scott Morrison gets rid of um, any, any time frames for the vaccine, um, I think that sends a, a shudder down our collective spines. And if you look, I, it, it's going to be hard to roll out the vaccines, but so is going to the moon. JFK said, we choose to go to the moon in, in this mm. decade. Uh, uh, he didn't say we choose to go to moon uh, at some time in the future. Um, we need to do it this year. And Noreen, you know, if you look at this, you look at the way Australia, and rightly, was praised for dealing with the crisis. You know, state and federal governments coming together in this national cabinet. Um, we saw off the worst of it. We acted really quickly. Compared to the United States, which obviously was devastated, but look how quickly they're getting the rollout together. Look how quickly people are getting vaccinated. And we're here dealing with this. What do you put this down to? I mean, obviously, there was the decision to go with AstraZeneca and put our, all our eggs Just or a lot of our eggs... warnings, though. A lot of our eggs into that basket. Yeah. But then there were disruptions to supply. Um, the government is being blamed for this, but is, are these also circumstances beyond that? No, I think it, it, it goes to questions of the government's competence. And I think that there's a very fine line between hip, hip pocket and vibe. I think Diane's right when you say about jobs. Um, cutting job keeper, I think, is really silly, even in the PM zone electorate. If you look at the way that people working in the travel industry have been here to all live in his electorate, lots and lots of Qantas employees live in his electorate. I think that's really problematic for them. I think the vibe when it comes to the incompetence of everything's going to be OK, we've got the vaccine, we've got the right vaccine despite all the warnings, next minute, you don't have to worry about this. It's something you don't have to worry about and it might be December. I think that, and there's no date, I think that um, it's really, as Sam said, it's really problematic that our country might be locked down for a couple of years when it comes to the end of the year and all of those people want their holidays. I think that that's going to be really problematic. And inbound tourism is really, the way that's headed in terms of the effect on jobs is really problematic. So there's a combination of the vibe and hip pocket. Uh, Parnell, um, what do you, when you look at, if we just isolate COVID here and want to come to the other issue of women in just a moment as well. But if you look at COVID, um, and yes, there are, this is a bit of a perfect storm, isn't it? Yes, we go all in for AstraZeneca, then we realise there are the issues with it. Then there are questions of getting the supply, the disruptions to supply chain. Is it, as the op opinion poll is showing, is it enough to say, well, the federal government is to blame here? Or are there extenuating circumstances? Of course there are. Of course there are. This is incredibly complex. And Something, some information has come out about a vaccine which is brand new, um, which is which the Australian government now has to take into account, and of course other governments around the world haven't had to take it into account in the same way because they were in a much more dire situation, and so the risk-benefit calculation of taking the vaccine for the population was very different. So. Of course it is. It's just a, an entirely different situation. We were doing well in Australia up until that point. Now the government did make a bit of a mistake. It um, sold itself last year on all of these good news stories about how well we'd managed COVID. And actually it should be, if it hadn't used up those stories in a way, it should be telling those stories this year and reminding us, look, you know, look at the US, look at the UK, so many people died. We, guys, we've actually made it through this very well. You know, fortunately, um, we are now in a position to roll out slowly, but they've used up a lot of their, their media mileage on that. And so now they're in a situation where they've actually over-promised 
um, on something that they can't really promise. You know, the, the vaccine was always going to be full of uncertainty. Um, the, the All the eggs in one basket argument, I think, is also a bit mm. disingenuous because mm. we're forgetting that Pfizer had massive problems for the Australian landscape when it was first developed. It needed to be cooled down to minus 70 degrees. So, you know, think about our geography and our climate and the logistics of, of distributing something along those lines. So... Of course things can go wrong and they have gone wrong. There are two issues with this, as I say. Number one is simply a media management one. They've been stuck in a situation of having thought that they were nearly at the end and there was just this tiny little administrative process of, a, of getting the vaccine out there, which was going to complete the whole job and they were going to look amazing. And so they used up all of that political mileage to get there. Um, and now they're caught in this situation where something's gone wrong there. Things have gone wrong on the other fronts, which they do in politics. And it seems for Australians, getting through the pandemic has become mm. simply table stakes. Mm. It's just, you know, we're there. D Diana, I want to come to the other issue when you look at these numbers. And, and what we have seen dramatically um, is a drop-off in support of women. We go from February to now, um, 42% in the, the survey, um, uh, so, sorry, uh, disapproval, 28% in February, 42% now. So this issue, which some may have thought was something that they could ride out or was a, a, a you know, a, a city feminist issue, is something clearly that is biting and clearly there are judgments being made about the Prime Minister's handling of this. When I, when I open my mouth and I say women are a disadvantaged segment of the community, um, often disenfranchised and we're 51% of the population, people sort of s often take a bit of a step back and go, really? But women are not included in the way that we feel we should be. No, we feel that as, um, you know, 51% of the population, we should have 51% of the leadership roles. You know, and we are in Australia a very well-educated cohort of women and we do many, you know, leadership roles so we can demonstrate that we're able to do that. When you don't feel that you're included in the way you should be, and this is something I don't need to tell you much about, really, and I should say it's wonderful to be here on the land of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. But when you're not included, you start to watch really closely. You ask different questions. You, you do. You watch closely, you ask different questions and you watch for the markers. The markers that say, oh, they have listened to me. The markers that say, they're still not listening to me. Things are getting better, maybe. Oh, no, things are getting worse again. And so I think opinion can move really fast when and you find is. yourself in and this. It and it is. Yeah. So this is what I think is going on here, that women have been watching for a long time. And it is just a sort of perfect storm of all of these different things that have come together in the political sphere with a spotlight on the political sphere and this is what's caused this cascading norm. Noreen, you are, as we introduced you, member of the Labor Party, and, um, you know, we have to say this too. Um, it's not as if Anthony Albanese is getting, you know, roaring approval. It's mm. not as if his numbers are going up proportionate to Scott Morrison's going down. There have been a lot of rumblings before all of this about the future of his leadership and whether he is someone who could lead the Labor Party to victory. Is the judgment also in on him. He is not convincing, I think that's really interesting. despite even the yeah, fall in Morrison. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think if you go back to the last election, there was all of that commentary around Shorten and how people just didn't like him, right? I think there is a commentary that because the Labor Party's been out of government, out of government for such a long time that there needs to be a saviour and they need to be some kind of heroic figure in order to lead. And if you look at leadership figures of the past, there's Whitlam and Hawke and they were quite Messiah-like and I think Hawke built that up over a long period in the public profile and I think that Whitlam wasn't thought about that at the, like that at the time. So I think we have unreal expectations of what the leader of the Labor Party should be. Um, there's some in, been some interesting commentary around about Anthony Albanese's factional background and it's the same as mine and that um, he knows very well to let women lead. 
in a situation like this and to shut up and let women lead. And to me, and that's what I've seen, I've seen Penny Wong, Wong and I've seen Christina Keneally leading and that's what I want to see. Um, I also think that there was no room during COVID. I think that the Labor Party took the right strategy during COVID. You only have to look at the criticism now that's being directed about politicising the vaccine. Right. So I think that it's it's a judgment call. I think that Morrison's on the nose. I really do. I haven't felt, frankly, so hopeful for quite a long time. He didn't he didn't have your vote to begin with. He didn't have mine to begin with. <laughs> but I haven't been cheering well, about where the Labor Party is. Hold, hold that thought, Dave. We'll we'll come, we'll come back to you in a later. Um, when you order takeaway food via one of the many <laughs> apps, have you ever considered how much money is passed onto the driver? It's not much or not enough to match the time it takes to get to the restaurant, wait for the food, navigate peak hour traffic, find a park and then deliver the food to you. Well, the perils of the gig economy, as it's known, have been aired at a federal Senate inquiry in Sydney. They've heard that low-wage, insecure work is rising in Australia. One of the drivers giving evidence is Assad Manzoor. Now, the Pakistani national is studying for his master's degree and is waiting for permanent residency. He told senators that people don't understand how the gig economy really works. Asad Manzura spoke to the drums, Eliza Harvey. When Asad Manzoor arrived in Australia six years ago to study at university, he threw himself into work. Anything that was offering delivery. And then gradually around 2016, these apps started showing up. Uber Eats was the first, then Deliveroo. So we started signing up on them. And initially they were paying really, really good. But as the years rolled on and more apps and riders flooded the market, the fee per job dropped. He found himself working more hours across more apps to make enough money to pay his bills. They make it pretty clear we are not employees, we are contractors. So they are pretty uh, clear on using the fact that the employee word is never used. They realise that, for one, students think they are grateful to it, they are not going to protest or speak up to it because they don't even realise they are being taken advantage of it. Because the only thing that matters is we need to judge them on an Australian standard. It's also important to note that... Um, the standards and protections afforded to workers are being investigated at a Federal Senate inquiry into job security. It's looking at how existing laws like minimum wage and safety standards are being implemented in what's known as the gig economy and how COVID has changed working conditions. Do you provide accident insurance uh, for your, your drivers? Last year after COVID, we did stop it and at the moment we're currently reviewing our insurance requirements. The biggest player in the market is Uber, which is committed to working with the government on any legislative change. It's all around flexibility and to be able to do a new type of work that fits into their lifestyle and where they can work within the needs of their life, whether it be their employment status, uh, whether it be their, where their children are, uh, it, it's quite a unique uh, proposition. For Asad Manzoor, responsibility also sits with customers. I had had people, you know, uh, having conversations and I came up with the food and I would drop and then it would be like we were invisible to them. So your essential message is that, that the customers should be treating the, the workers with more dignity yeah. and respect. Basically, like just understand the fact that when he gets to your door, his job ends. The, it's a door-to-door -door delivery. So if your door is three stories further up, main door, it's not to your bed, it's just your door. Meet him there, greet him there, just take it over. So he saves time and he can get back to instead of putting 10, 12 extra minutes of work into it. Sam, when it comes to questions of the, the gig economy, um, it's not an abstract issue for you. It's something that, you know, from your childhood, you directly relate to, isn't it? It's something that was part of your own family's upbringing. Yeah, uh, the casualisation of the of the workforce is becoming more and more prevalent, um, and there were certainly cracks um, before COVID. What we've seen uh, is that those cracks have opened up for all to see over the pandemic. So um, we know that uh, that people who are more likely to lose their jobs um, have been in lower-paid work and they've been in insecure work. 
So this, like we heard just then, this is impacting people from uh, migrant communities, mm. migrant workers. Uh, it's also uh, having a greater impact on people with disabilities. It's having a greater impact on single parents, young people, um, and and women in general as well. So heaven forbid, um, you're or you're a, um, a a single mother uh, from a migrant community with a disability because the impact is going to be even greater. Um, I certainly, in my own childhood, um, my mum, as a single parent, would have five or six mm. casual jobs to put food on our table and to make sure that we got an education, my brother and I got an education. Com com compare if, that then to now, Sam, and how do you think you'd fare today in these circumstances, the pay, the unpredictability of this work? H how do you compare those, to that, those experiences? Yeah, it's certainly... Um, it's certainly sped up. It is a race to the bottom now, particularly with the gig economy, and that's coming out uh, in the Senate uh, to the Senate committee in the last couple of days. But if the pandemic had hit um, uh, when 20 years ago, when um, when I was sort of in high school, um, the focus would would have very much been on putting food on the table, and I could have forgotten that education. I wouldn't be here talking to mm. you now. Um, and my concern with right now is how many people are in that situation. We're going to see figures of job losses coming out over the next months and years, particularly with the end of JobKeeper. But this is going to impact a generation of people who won't be able to break the cycle of poverty. Parnell, if people can't live a dignified life, if people are not earning a minimum wage, um, then clearly there is something wrong, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's obviously a problem. And I think we need to make the distinction about casualisation in that there are different levels of casualisation. So at the at the skilled end, at the high level end, it's actually quite a positive thing for a lot of people. I employ freelancers, mm. you know, they call the shots a lot of the time. They're high skilled people who can basically set their terms and want the flexibility. At the other end of the scale, you've got the very low skilled workers who can't who don't call the shots, who can't set their own terms. And it's a bit of a joke saying that, you know, it's all about the lifestyle and the flexibility for them. Actually, they need any work and and so, you know, they take what they can get in those in those terms. And so yes, it would be better if we could target that low skilled end of the casualized workforce and say, well, what can we do to ensure that they're getting paid adequately, that their terms mm -hmm. and conditions are fair? but also to ensure that in our society we don't have too many people who are in a situation of needing to take low-skilled work. Yeah, but Noreen, you look at these circumstances and you're looking at people in Asa Manzur's case. You know, he's here, he's awaiting his permanent residency, he's studying, a lot of people are studying from overseas. They don't have that support, family support, um, union support, who's speaking for them. There's, you, you, you're having to work just to put food on the table, if that, if that with none of the protections. If that. I think I've noticed um, that the TWU, that the Transport Workers Union has taken up this matter really seriously and is campaigning for gig economy workers in their area of coverage, so uh, that gives me comfort. But what really distresses me is the notion of the minimum wage and how that can be simply um, that, that we need to keep that as a safety net in this country. We need it for the economy, we need it for the protection of workers, we need it so that there's enough money going around the economy. We don't want a scenario where it is normal um, for employers to use this notion of people being independent contractors not to pay the minimum hourly rate. That's what worries me the most, as well as the health and safety aspects. Five people have lost their lives. Mm. Five people have passed away mm. as a result of their employers. That's not how we want this country to be. Yeah, Diane, Noreen's right. We're not just talking about issues of, of you know, work, how people are treated in the workplace or whether people are being paid enough money, but lives on the line. And you see this. You see people out, you know, riding bicycles in the driving rain to deliver a hamburger to someone. Yeah. It does no credit to us as individuals or as a nation. I think we missed a huge opportunity in the last little while when we were going to have this big industrial relations reform that was coming out of the back of COVID. You know, so we had this big event where all of a sudden we all had to pull together 
because it was existential threat. So everybody leapt in and started to have a proper dialogue. But how quickly did that fritter away? And at core, you know, how did we end up in this circumstance? You know, we get ourselves in a place where we institutionalised and made, you know, our workplace laws too much of a straitjacket. So then we swing the pendulum way down the other end and we have this incredible flexibility which really doesn't suit um, the situation of people that, as you say, have no power in the workplace, becomes a complete and utter tragedy. People start to lose their lives all of a sudden. Oh, we've got to do something about this. If I have to hear one more person say to me, oh, yes, but I tipped the bicycle guy. Mm. And I think, please, that is not enough to assuage your guilt. You know, yes, we'll all tip the guy, but wouldn't it be better to pay him a proper wage in the first place? Mm. Mm. Uh, Parnell, can I come to you on that? Uh, on, you know, you, you've talked there before about the versatility of the workforce and how that can work for some people and casualisation, a gig economy, if you're highly skilled, um, you can make that work for you and you can be in a strong bargaining position. We're not talking about that. Yeah. But this pendulum that, that, that we were talking about just then and this idea that it swings too far one way and the, the IR laws are too restrictive and it swings back the other way and they're too exploitative. How do we get that balance right, given that we're also dealing with a young, transient population, people from overseas, who are also in a precarious position mm. to begin with? Mm. That's, that's the key, really, because we all forget that there is a simple reality. People take jobs yeah. and take low wages because they have some other objective. And in Australia, that is particularly clear because we have a very expansive social safety net except for people from who've come in here who've come to Australia to study and are hoping to get permanent residency who are often in a very difficult position because they want to they want to stay here uh, they need to earn some money and so they will take jobs which give them that sort of job history and a little bit of money but often much much less than they would be able to command if they were an Australian or much less than they would have mm. to subsist on if they also had access to the social safety net. So there needs to be some other examination of how we can prevent that from happening, how we can give them back the power or ensure that they really are getting paid adequately because, you know, it's there is an argument to, you know, there. If people are coming to Australia, you, you can't put everybody straight onto the social safety net. That's, that is a whole other immigration discussion, which I'm sure we'll be having shortly as the borders open again. Um, but, but you do have to ensure that everybody who comes here has access to the, the sort of fairness that, w that Australians expect every worker to have access to. Which, Sam, is what Australia had prided itself on. And, you know, you haven't seen traditionally in Australia the more exploitative end of migrant workers that you see in places like the United States where illegal workers come in and they do the dirty work that other people won't do or you know living in parts of Asia where particularly people from the Philippines are having to go and work and often clean houses or, or work as nannies for for you know not not great salary um, but what does it tell us about the society as well that we've always had home deliveries but it wasn't at this exploitative level but where we live in a society where if you want to, we've been talking about this before we even got this discussion, <laughs> some of the worst examples, and we have them in our own families. We all do. And we, you know, I use Uber Eats and I use Menu Log. And, um, uh, but, but how do we, what does it tell us about us that that convenience rules over that concern, if you like? I think that's right. And that perhaps for a moment there during the pandemic and uh, for me in Melbourne, um, uh, we all felt, there was a moment where we all felt like we were in this together um, during the lockdowns. But I'd uh, often go to the restaurants around my area uh, and the people, the restaurateurs that will tell me, please, they'll beg, don't go to Uber Eats, just give me a call, come down to the restaurants your, yourself. Because um, the... Um, the restaurants themselves are, are getting dotted. Not only the workers, the workers are paying paid less than minimum wage at times. They're not getting super, they're not getting leave entitlements, mm. they're not getting workers' compensation. But the restaurants are really doing it hard as well because they're getting um, charged around 30% uh, um, of their takings just for using a platform that's been cornered. 
Um, the taxpayer is not doing very well either. Uber in 2018 paid just over 1% of its profits in, uh, in tax um, because of shifting profits overseas or trying to corner the market uh, by employing uh, celebrities to, to advertise their product. Um, mm. Kim Kardashian and Sharon Streslecki don't come cheap. The, um, I think what it, it gets down to is the, the egalitarian myth of Australian society that when it comes to convenience, um, we're choosing convenience. Um, the number of times during the pandemic there would be a, a package delivered um, next to my door for a neighbour and then it would go cold and then that driver wouldn't even be, be paid for that work. Um, I think we have to take a, a, a bigger look at the convenience in our own lives and uh, also to question whether we can just walk down the street and get takeaway mm. from the restaurant. Well, I've only got a little bit of time left, but just, just quickly on that, Diane, though, there is the other argument that people also need the work mm. and they are doing it because they desperately need mm. that work. Yeah, absolutely. And we're a nation of adopters, you know, so you get something like an Uber Eats and isn't this exciting and everybody wants to have a go and then it just becomes part of the way that you do this. And while there are people that want this work, you know, that's going to feed into that system. You know, and I think that's why we need minimum wage protections. Well, we need legal frameworks. About. We need legal frameworks. We need strong unions. Mm. And we need unions, you know, that punch above their weight, mm. you know, in the way that they do at the moment to ensure that there is some coverage for those people, even if they're not union members. You're watching The Drum and with me on the panel, Chair of the Committee of Economic Development Australia, Diane Smith-Gander, Industry Professor at the Jambana Institute and Labor Party member, Noreen Young, Managing Director of Communications firm, Agenda C, Parnell McGuinness, and in Melbourne, lawyer, disability advocate and former Green staffer, Sam Drummond. Well, Christine Holgate, the former chief executive of Australia Post, has used a Senate inquiry to unleash an extraordinary attack on the Prime Minister. She has said she never voluntarily stood aside from her role and alleges that the Australia Post chair unlawfully stood her down and, quote, lied repeatedly to the Australian people, unquote. Allegations he denies. The simple truth is I was bullied out of my job. I was humiliated and driven to despair. I was thrown under the bus so the chairman of Australia Post could curry favour with his political masters. But I'm still here, and I'm stronger for surviving it. I'm putting to you today, I was unlawfully stood down, and my contract got repudiated. I've only ever asked for respect, and I have never been allowed it. So maybe I answer that slightly differently. I don't know why the Prime Minister did what he did. But I was unlawfully stood down, I believe, because he instructed it to do so. Well, in November, it was revealed that Holgate had used company funds to purchase four Cartier watches as thank yous for senior executives. There were calls for her to stand down and Scott Morrison castigated Holgate in Parliament. When asked today how much her treatment was a question of gender, Christine Holgate had this to say. I've never seen a media article comment about a male politician's watch, you know, and yet I was depicted as a prostitute for making those comments, humiliated. I have never seen any male public servant depicted in that way. So do I believe it's partially a gender issue? You're absolutely right, I do, mm -hmm. but do I believe the real problem here is bullying and harassment and abuse of power. You're absolutely right, I do. But perhaps the most explosive testimony was saved for the afternoon when we heard from the chair of Australia Post who revealed that Communications Minister Paul Fletcher wanted Christine Holgate stood down. He wanted us to support the investigation. There would be an investigation. He wanted us to support the investigation and he wanted us to look at standing Christine down I queried whether that was what he really wanted. He said, look, I'm going to come back to you. And we had the later discussion where that was all reaffirmed. So the minister asked you to stand Christine Holgate aside? Yes. Diane, um, we were discussing before you came on air, and you know Christine Holgate. Um, you've been in contact with her. Watching this today, that 
extraordinarily assured, very powerful um, testimony that she gave. What were you thinking watching that today, knowing her as you do? Christine and I are both members of Chief Executive Women, and so I've known her for a long time. Um, I come from Perth, as, as you know, and, and this was the jacket I packed. I, I wasn't making the white statement. But when you hear something as raw as that, the truth of it shines through to you. And when you know and respect the person, you have a very good basis for understanding the truth of what they're saying. It makes you angry, it makes you want to cry. That's how it made me feel. And Parnell, we were just discussing before that the hit that Scott Morrison has taken with female voters, and you listen to that, and the language, bullying, being publicly castigated, um, the treatment in the media, um, the impact it had on her, as I say before, very assured, very direct, very confident, but absolutely having the Prime Minister in her sights. What impact does that have? Oh, it's, it's huge. Look, the women of Australia will be watching this. Um, they will be watching how a woman in a powerful job is treated and they will be relating it, all working women will be relating it to their own circumstance. How do we expect to be treated? What example is this giving of how women should be treated in the workforce? Because there is a sense, as Christine Holgate said, that in some part this kerfuffle was related to her gender. So some of the some of the information that was released was that she was expensing um, haircuts and makeup and things like that. Now she's made it clear since that they were for big speeches and for big appearances, mm. but there is a clear gendered nature to this attack. Um, or from who, from wherever that came, that information came, that made it into the media. And Noreen, um, the the chair, Di Bartolomeo, um, was being directly accused by Christian Holgate of having lied. Um, that he pressured her into uh, standing down, resigning from a job that she said that she had loved. Um, he denies that, um, and yet says the board owes no apology. And now we have this allegation that was Paul Fletcher who wanted her, uh, Christine Holgate, to go. So even now, with that, th that testimony today, there is still the dispute, and a dispute at, the, at that board level about what happened, what precipitated the resignation, whether it was justified, who wanted her gone, under what circumstances. And off the top of my head, the, the workplace situation will be constructive dismissal at best. So clearly she's been forced to behave, uh, to, leave, to leave her job, to abandon duties, um, not of her own volition. So the interference of Fletcher and the board, the quickness of the Prime Minister to jump, clearly gendered behaviour. As Parnell says, the women of Australia will be watching this. We all know there's an underestimation in the Liberal Party, it seems to me, of the impact of feminism and the impact of populist feminism in the population. And um, I think, uh, it, you know, obviously, Stan, I've got issues when it comes to corporate and mainstream feminism and its neglect of Aboriginal women, but, there isn't a netball team in Australia who, who doesn't understand the impact of feminism and people understand what it is like, women understand what it's like in the workplace, Aboriginal women in particular, to be discriminated against. And that's what the perception will be that has happened to Christine Holgate. Uh, Sam, it's not even a question of talking about feminism um, or, or politics. It's actually also a question of fairness and justice, isn't it? I mean, we, we use those terms, feminism, for something here clearly that she is saying there was a difference in the way I was treated, the pressure that was put on me, the Prime Minister never spoke to her about that, she requested minister meetings with government that never happened, um, and that the way she was depicted. It is, it is qu clearly questions of fairness and justice that she is going to, added to the dynamite right now of, of gender, much has been made of her wearing today su suffragette white, in this climate um, that makes this particularly powerful. Absolutely, it was um, it, it was a powerful um, powerful footage that we saw. Um, and to to paraphrase Julia Julia Gillard, it, 
it didn't explain everything. It didn't explain nothing. Mm. Um, the the watches were a bad look. We we have to acknowledge that. But if you look at some of the things that were happening at the same time, um, her predecessor Ahmed Fahur was uh, on about five million mm. more than she was in his last year in the job. Um, at the same time, there was taxpayer money being paid to uh, that was. Uh, had questions raised, um, going to ASIC executives, uh, to landowners um, of what will be or may be Western Sydney Airport, um, and then uh, money going to uh, marginal seats with um, the sports frauds scandal. So it, whether it looks proportionate, uh, proportionate, I think, as everyone else has said, um, women are going to have a big say on that. Diane, Sam raises that question then of the Cartier watches and, you know, cast your mind back to when this story was breaking the way it was depicted. It was this company largesse, oh my God, handing out Cartier watches and that really grabbed all of the headlines. It framed, it made it look self-indulgent, didn't it? How much of that was a factor here, particularly uh, in that initial response? that we saw, the fact that it was this, this, uh, this luxury item, something that was seen to be indulgent. You know, it's the brand name and Christine is clearly a person of style and she does wear a very nice watch and I think if that's her choice, then it should be her choice. Um, it's always very difficult when you're being judged on some actions that were taken some years ago by today's mm -hmm. standards. And I think Christine is a very good leader and she had done amazing things at Australia Post. The safety outcomes there, we had her on the Cedar stage talking about this, the delivery people, the changes that she made to ensure sustainable employment for that workforce. Mm. Now, I suspect that there was some reason why that was a particularly apposite gift mm. for Christine to give to those people. Um, and we're never going to be able to understand the truth of that. So I think it is very sad that that became such well, a kind of moment symbol, in the story, it? yes, and it was the wrong symbol. Now, when that sort of thing happens, leaders step up and they should frame the question for people who are interested in it. And what we saw was some framing from people in political leadership and people in the leadership of Australia Post who chose to take it in a particular direction. And that's the thing that I'm most disappointed about because I don't think it helped anybody. Parnell, you could look at the Cartier watches and say, is that a, a, a poor call? Is that a mis, misjudgment? But you could also set that against um, some of the extraordinary bonuses that people in corporate life get, where you could buy a dozen Cartier watches if you wanted That's with the bonuses it. that people get. Look, to be frank, she should be thanked for saving the business money. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. And Diane is quite right about the framing. There was a choice that was made at that stage to either say, look, in the scheme of things, these watches, which were four bonuses for $20,000, were actually a massive saving to the business. Moreover, there is symbolism in choosing something which people wear on a day-to-day -day basis, which reminds the workforce these people have been rewarded by the business for doing a really great job. So that's a symbolism for them every time they look at their watch, and it's symbolism for the entire workforce seeing them wearing the watches. So there is an encouragement incentive in that. I actually think there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this particular bonus, and it should have been put in context immediately by the people who were responsible for the framing of the question, saying, look, you know, the, the total cost of these bonuses was low, Christine Holgate has, has acted responsibly. She's done a great job at, at Australia Post and we back her. It looks like there was some other agenda in this. I don't want to speculate on what that was, but at some point I think that's going to come out. And, um, and look, I hope for all concerned that they've thought about what their position is in this and that perhaps they think about whether an apology is due now. I'll come to that in a minute. Noreen, I'll come to you in a second. But Sam... You looked as though you wanted to say something there, or you may have had a response to, to what Parnell was saying there around bonuses and the watches and the like. Uh, I, I, I don't think it was appropriate. Um, I think if you ask the, the person on a, on, if, 
if you ask a person who's delivering for ten dollars an hour mm. through uh, Uber Eats, and we were talking about that before, without any workers' protections, whether um, getting a spending uh, three thousand dollars on uh, on a single watch or um, twenty thousand dollars on a bunch of watches is is okay. Um, I I don't think that they would say it's okay. The the average person on the street would think it's okay. Um, but I do acknowledge that in the context of some of the other um, some of the other expenditures of taxpayers' money, it's quite insignificant. And that um, well, I'll be interested to see if there is something else that comes out um, that shows another reason for the. For the sacking, Noreen, you're not wearing a Cartier watch. I might, no, I might a Fitbit. A, fit, a Fitbit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's certainly not worth three thousand no. dollars. But I, I suspect you also wouldn't be comfortable in, with corporate largesse and and bonuses. But how do you separate these things, or can you separate these things from from you know the 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 extremes or the you know, the let them eat cake luxury of Cartier watches? And also the way this was framed, as Diane and Parnell have said, and, the, and certainly what we've ended up today with questions of gender, impropriety, the use of power and disproportionate punishment. Because it was a bad look, as was said, right? And as Sam said, the average person is not going to have sympathy for Christine or anyone who's giving away Cartier watches, right? It's just really straightforward. But as the story's developed, there is a growing awareness that that is maybe the kind of thing that happens in corporate world, that people do get enormous bonuses, and they do. And I was CEO of DC of Diversity Council Australia for seven years, and I knew a lot of corporates then, and people make an enormous amount of money in those environments. They just do. Whether that's right or wrong is, is irrelevant. They just do. But I think that as the intricacies of the story have emerged, and clearly, we've all seen how the Prime Minister behaved in, parla in the Parliament about Ms Holgate. That was pretty intense. It was pretty bad behaviour. It was pretty hatey. Nobody wants to see that. And that's where it's settled. So as Parnell says, people better be very sure of their positions as the details emerge. And there's another story there, which is about the board of this organisation. That seems to have been absolutely still saying, flat. still saying no apology. And still saying no apology. And, and that's what I'm saying about the board have made it difficult for Christine to work in that situation. What legal action is she going to take? Where does this sit now for you? Diane, when you look at this, um, an apology called for, clearly reinstatement's not an option now. Um, where does this sit right now? I think it sits in a very difficult place. Um, I hope that we'll take some big picture stuff out of it too. You know, as Noreen has said, there's a real issue with how boards are constructed. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like Kate Jenkins' uh, investigation. This inquiry, yeah. Yes, the inquiry to be extended not just to how ministers' offices get staffed, but ministers have the gift on who shall be on boards. And there is a certain amount of process around it. And of course, remuneration is done very independently. But I believe that the staffing of the boards, the populating the board should be done by an independent authority. And I think absent that, we will continue to have mm. these sorts of issues mm. where the boards and the ministers have this horrible grey area. So keep the minister at arm's length well, from direct appointment? Well, the minister is the or? shareholder. They have to be the shareholder. But I do believe that you could be able to have an independent authority that would do a skills-based assessment with an appropriate fit and proper person assessment that would give us much better outcomes than we get at the minute. Well, moving on now, nearly one in five people have a disability, and yet many businesses across Australia remain inaccessible to many. When Chef Craig Shanahan was left legally blind from a brain tumour, he found out just how challenging navigating a cafe can be. So he set about finding out more about how to create a space that would not only help himself, but make others feel more comfortable. The drum Stephanie Bolchi sat down with Craig at his newly opened cafe in Penrith in Greater Western Sydney. <laughs> People used to always say to me, what's it like with one eye? I used to say, um, what's it like with two eyes? But when I was two, my mum uh, noticed something was a bit different with my left eye. They obviously found that I had a rhabdomyosarcoma, 
which is a cancerous tumour. So that's when I began treatment and then eventually they um, decided to take the whole left eye out. <laughs> Growing up, it was quite normal, I would say. Um, obviously, I uh, going to school and that, like I was a bit different to others, but I never really let it bother me. 2014 was when I was diagnosed with a brain tumour. I was working as a chef at the time and kind of training to be a sous chef, so I would get headaches, um, sometimes be, be ill. Pretty much same day as I went to the GP, did a scan and found out that I had a, a nine by four centimetre tumour. It was described to myself was the size of a mango. When I did wake up after the surgery, I could see what I can now, so obviously shadows, silhouettes, and I always thought, well, maybe it's just my eye adjusting. The longer it went on, I realised that my optic nerve was damaged. Obviously, I had my days where I was very kind of sad, and I never really thought, why me? But it was just like, what do I do now, in a way? Like, my job's gone. Speaking to a few of my friends, they're like, oh, I don't really go out much because, you know, there might be a step there or, you know, if I'm walking through the door, it's, it's a bit squashy. I wanted to create somewhere where they would feel comfortable to come by themselves. They didn't really have much awareness of how to treat someone that was maybe vision impaired or to the simple task of reading the menu. Like, if I was by myself, I'd just order something that I knew they might have on the menu. With us, we, we have our staff trained to either ask them what they would like or um, have the accessibility to get the menu um, on the iPad, which has voiceover. And then obviously um, we're looking at bringing Braille menus in. There's a lot of room in this place. Um, we haven't compacted it with tables and chairs, but I need to also be able to navigate. Again, I went with the wood theme uh, for our tabletops and then the black chairs. That way I can see a chair if it's pulled out and also um, use it as kind of a line in regards to where to go. That's the whole idea with the space. Um, no one's, like, obviously not welcome. A battle between Australian and New Zealand beekeepers is turning sour, excuse the pun. <laughs> Over the past five years, Kiwi producers of the famous... <laughs> I didn't know. Dad, Dad I, didn't know. Joe. I just said it. <laughs> Manuka Honey have been fighting for the exclusive rights to the word, arguing it's a Maori name inextricably tied to New Zealand. But with Manuka retailing for hundreds of dollars a kilo, Australian beekeepers have warned that losing the trademark would be damaging for at least 500 businesses. It would devastate a lot of people's businesses and the industry here. We, we have no problems with the New Zealanders using the word manuka with a macron over the A or a double A, which is the correct spelling and has a meaning in New Zealand. That's absolutely understood. But the way we spell it as manuka doesn't have any of those. And so we simply want to be able to use our own spelling of our own word to trade as we should be able to trade. Well, any change could also drive up prices for consumers and the federal government believes a joint trans-Tasman approach could help the honey industry avoid these impacts. I propose that the Australian and New Zealand governments jointly facilitate a workshop with our respective Manuka honey industries, including in areas such as industry development, research, joint marketing, technology sharing and addressing fraudulent honey products. Who owns it, Noreen? Well, obviously, I would say Amari. You know, and but in obvious, what's interesting is that in our briefing about this today, I didn't say that Mari is saying this, mm. right? I'm not saying that Mari is saying it. If it was Mari saying it, I might have a different view. But it seems to me it's the New Zealand honey in this industry, and mm. I don't know what involvement Mari who, have who, in that. Who may have taken Mari name right? anyway, right? Okay, and there's all the question here, for example, about food and food sources and who owns a lot of those things and whether Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, Islander people, are being properly recompensed. So it might be the same. I don't know. I have no knowledge of the honey, honey industry. Call me odd, right? So let's see. Let's do some more investigation. But for goodness sake, sort it out. Like, can you not? These are mature men, aren't they? But what a solution, Parnell, where they're going, 
Uh, it comes down to how you pronounce it. And here we <laughs> pronounce it and spell it one way. Over there they pronounce it and spell it another way. So we'll leave it at that. I don't think that's going to solve it somehow. <laughs> no, isn't it complete nonsense? I mean, you know, on the other hand, they could say, oh, well, you know, but we've got Canberra Manuka. So, you know, <laughs> so we'll name it after that. Look, I think there is a really simple solution here. You call it Manuka AUS and Manuka NZ. And those are to the two products and you work in concert, done. Uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, guys, it's from the same tree. It's the Monica tree. Just take it, run with it, market it, and leave it be. It does remind you, Sam, remember the, the whole thing about champagne and, you know, is it just French and is it just sparkling wine here? And I suppose that idea of, you know, if, if something is cultural and something is from a particular country and pertains to a particular culture and different, or region or whatever, then there is a there is a proprietorial sort of claim on something like this. How do you see it being resolved? Yeah, I don't and, and there are jobs on the line as well, of course. That's the other thing. Mm. Absolutely. We don't want to get into that tit-for-tat that's happening in Europe with all all of those products. Um, the uh, the leptospermum tree is <laughs> uh, is native to both Australia and New Zealand. I've got one in my in my backyard, so presumably I could make some uh, manuka honey as well. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that leptospermum uh, honey is going to sell sell off the the shelves in the health food aisle. So. Um, if we can sort out a sensible uh, solution, whether it's a dash on the A or uh, <laughs> and no dash or a, an AUS and an NZ, let's just get it sorted. Well, this is where you live, Diane. You know, we're talking about economic <laughs> development. Um, and, 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 you know, yeah, we can have a debate about the naming, but, but there, are, there is an industry here. Um, and it's it's expensive too, you know. This is high priced honey. This is something that's a really flash honey. Yeah, yeah. flash honey. It's flash, flash honey. honey. You know, and let's face it, bees are really important. We yes. need more bees. We need bees doing their thing. You know, if yeah. I was going to worry about things to do with bees and honey, this would be about ninety ninth on my <laughs> priority list. Yeah. I thought, you know, it was named after the Canberra suburb too. Oh, but we don't, we don't even get that name right. Yeah, I've been calling that Monica. Yeah, that's that? right. Yeah. What's that about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so... I in fact said Monica honey. Did you? For a long time, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. That's what I thought it was. So yeah. I do think, yes, look, there is an industry there and it is very important, but I'm sure they can solve it rather rapidly. Yeah, but... Let's just what, we, share it for heaven's well, sakes. Well, that, that's exactly what Parnell said. Exactly. Do you think it comes down to that? Um, Manuka NZ, Manuka Oz. I think so. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And I like postcode honey but because it's it, of its health benefits. I'm not going to be buying any of it anytime soon. Is it, a, is it a microcosm of the patriarchy just being so ridiculous and not being able well, that to brings sort us, I that brings us, out? That brings us full, that <laughs> brings us full circle. We're right, like, back at, really? we're right back at the Prime Minister's um, popularity <laughs> problem. Thank you so much. Thanks to all, uh, all of our panel. That's all we've got time for. Diane Smith-Gander. Noreen Young, Parnell McGuinness and Sam Drummond. Have a fantastic evening. Patricia Carvelis is going to be with you tomorrow night. Good night. Whenever you want, wear it.